Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to another private chat on the Voice of the Desert channel. I see we already have one thumbs down on this uh, broadcast. It came before we started, so at least it's nothing personal against me. That's nice to know. But it does let me know that there are people out there keenly waiting to see what will happen today for one reason or another. <laughs> well, if you've got uh, questions or comments uh, that you want to pass on, you can write them while I'm speaking. And uh, okay, and the address for that is Avid Moderator One. That's all one word, and the one is a numeral. Avid Moderator One at gmail.com. That'll be on the screen, but it's a bit hard to read. So I thought I should uh, get you to write it down now if you have uh, uh, any intentions of participating in the chat this morning. Now, I labored all day yesterday and uh, working on, on a script for today, the subject being the kingdom of heaven. And I had the advantage that I had a lot of material that I've produced in the past, and I, I, I worked through that and, and went over and over and over. And, and it just seems like it's a subject that nobody can really do justice uh, because I don't think any one of us fully comprehends just what this kingdom of heaven is. You think about Jesus himself. Here he was, the son of God, and throughout three and a half years, he was trying right up to the end to communicate something that the human mind just uh, has a very difficult time trying to grasp, the kingdom of heaven. Nevertheless, we'll uh, do what we can this morning, and I just, uh, I pray that you'll pray that we can all have our minds open to some new revelation, some better understanding of what it is exactly that Jesus came to offer to the human race. Jesus said a lot of things about this kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, and many of his parables attempted to clarify what he meant about it. Now, I've tried to get a picture just by going through the, the whole lot of them and, and, and just getting a feel for uh, you know the, the main emphasis that Jesus had in his ministry, as I could understand it and uh, try to understand how this kingdom that Jesus was talking about differs from every other kingdom and how it differs from every other religion. And I'm going to share a little bit today of what I've found. In the Old Testament, there was the kingdom of Israel. And from that, we get the Jewish religion. And other parts of the world, there are other religions, like Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, etc. And of course, there is the Christian religion. But I found that the kingdom that Jesus was talking about is different to all of the others. And that all the others have certain things in common, which kind of contradict what Jesus was describing. In fact, it seems that Christianity, the way Jesus preached it, is kind of anti-religion. Something so different as to be almost opposite to all the religions of the world. Let me illustrate. What's the usual approach to religious buildings that religions take everywhere? The Jews, they had their synagogues, but they also had a temple where they believed God lived. A lot of work and wealth went into that temple. Hindus and Buddhists have temples too. Some of them extremely elaborate. Muslims have mosques. And so-called Christian religion has everything from chapels to cathedrals. Buildings, buildings, buildings. Everywhere, there are religious buildings. Now, Jesus got into trouble for actually predicting the end of all those buildings, as you can see in the passage on your screen at the moment. Jesus said that there was going to be a day when not one stone would be left upon another in that temple that they were so proud of. He knew that the Jewish temple in Jerusalem was supposed to be a house of prayer, but he also knew it was not. It had developed into a business with money changers and livestock salesmen dominating the scene. When it came time for Jesus to be executed, the Bible says that there was only one thing that witnesses could agree on against him. And that was that he had threatened their building. Sure, they misunderstood 
what he was actually saying, but he did predict that the temple would be destroyed. I'm reading the scripture on your screen at the moment about Jesus' encounter with this Samaritan woman at the well who was arguing over where they should worship, whether it should be in Jerusalem or in a temple that they had there in Samaria. Jesus told this woman that a time was coming when it would not matter whether she worshipped God in the temple in Jerusalem or not. That what God is really looking for are people who have a humble spirit and a sincere hunger for the truth. Forget the buildings. And then when Jesus died, he said, it is finished. And the Bible says that the great thick curtain in the temple that supposedly covered the place where God lived was torn in two from top to bottom. It was the end of buildings. God had broken out of the box. On numerous occasions in the New Testament epistles, we are told that our bodies are God's temple now. We don't need a building. The Holy Spirit wants to live in us and go with us wherever we go. True Christians never go to church because we are the church. The first Christians were famous for selling all their buildings rather than buying and making new ones. So that's just one way that the kingdom of heaven is different to religions everywhere. It's not about buildings. Wherever two or three followers of Jesus are gathered together, Jesus says he's there. Whether it's in a park or in a car or just walking down the street, you are the church. You don't need a building anymore. Now, the next thing I noticed about the kingdom of heaven is that it is not about health. Even though religions everywhere get into health, often in a very big way. Mostly, religions carry on about clean versus unclean foods. But there are a lot of other rules as well. Like injunctions against smoking and drinking, against drugs, against getting vaccinations, against eating sugar, against just about everything that could possibly go into your mouth. Some people teach that God can heal you miraculously, but they also confuse good health with being spiritual. I've been around these people and you're almost afraid to admit that you have a cold in the presence because someone's gonna say it's because you don't have enough faith. So once again, good health becomes proof of how spiritual people are. Now that's the way of religions everywhere. But what about Jesus? He didn't do that. Sure, he healed people, but he also taught that just being sick does not mean that you didn't did anything wrong. In fact, in the passage on your screen at the moment, we see that when he was talking about a blind man, he said that the blind man could see better spiritually than the religious leaders who were in good health. Why? Because those religious leaders could not see the things that God was wanting to show them. And good health has nothing to do with being able to see them either. Good health is pretty much selfish. Jesus himself was accused <clears throat> of being a glutton and an alcoholic because he ate and drank with people who were not religious. He said, it's not what goes into your mouth that makes you evil, but it's the thoughts that come out of your heart. He even said that God can protect us if we eat it or drink anything that is unhealthy or poisonous. It's quite a promise. And the promise actually had to do with the fact that they were going to go into situations, and you will go into situations if you go into the, all the world preaching the gospel, where the food is not healthy and the water is dangerous, but God can still protect us. And we, we see in this long passage on the screen here where Peter was told by God three times, actually, to eat unclean animals. Why was God asking him to do that? It was so that 
Peter would not offend the people from non-Jewish religions with all of his Jewish health rules when they went out preaching the good news about Jesus. And yet still today, there's no end of people wanting to tell you that if you just stop eating meat or you eat a little more garlic, it'll heal you of all your diseases and make you a better person before God. There's a whole movement that's trying to get the church back into uh, all the health rules of the Old Testament, as though that's what God was all about, and that's what Jesus was all about. Well, Paul had a good answer for all of them. He said, meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. And that's it. That's, that's not going to make any difference what you eat. It's what's in your heart that Jesus was looking at. So that was one of the other differences between Jesus and uh, uh, his kingdom of heaven and all the other religions of the world. Now we move on to another one, which we call rituals or sacraments. Now, in the Old Testament, they didn't have the word sacrament, okay? But they used the word sacrifices. It actually is quite different in meaning. But even the sacrifices and the sacraments as well had important meanings. It's just that people very quickly forget what the meaning is, and then they just start looking at the ritual or make a ritual out of something that could have been quite significant. Blindly following the rule. And God got tired of that. He could see that's what was happening. People were just you know, going through the motions. And that continues to happen today. There are similar rituals in other religions as well. But particularly you see it in Christianity, like taking off your shoes when you enter a temple, crossing yourself with holy water, ringing bells and burning incense, even covering people with water or putting ashes on their foreheads. But all that God really wants for us to do is to love him and to love others. Jesus said that love is better than all the sacraments in the world. As you can see in this passage on the screen now. That's what he was looking for. And yet we continue as a, a religion to go back to the sacraments and, and to look there to try to determine who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. Some of these rituals take the form of special prayers, which people recite or sing or chant or just repeat over and over and over, hundreds of times sometimes. Even, even in uh, Christian religions, we just go through the motions when we pray. Not really forming a personal relationship with the God we're supposedly praying to. And Jesus spoke out against that. Now, with, with regard to the ritual of covering people with water, Jesus taught that we need to be covered with God's Holy Spirit instead. But that's frustrating, you see. And this is, again, one of these differences between the kingdom of heaven and religion. Because you can't see the Holy Spirit. Everything Jesus emphasized were things that you can't see, that you can't measure. You can't say, these are the good guys and those are the bad guys. Religions everywhere want some visible way to distinguish the good from the bad, the saved from the unsaved. But the bottom line is that God is not looking for religious rituals. What he's looking for are people who will obey his son. And that has been the emphasis of this channel, and I hope it will always be the emphasis of this channel. Obedience to Jesus Christ. None of us does it perfectly, but it's the direction we need to be heading in. And it's what's been left out what's being ignored in all of these others, the rituals and the buildings and the, uh, everything else, comes in as a replacement for obeying his son. The one thing you won't find in religions anywhere, and especially in the Christian religion, unfortunately, is obedience to Jesus Christ. So we'll move on to one more difference between the kingdom of heaven and all religions of the world. Religions everywhere promote special holy days when they can have their meetings. They come together one day a week. The holy day may be Friday, as it is for Muslims. It could be Saturday, as it is for Jews and Seventh-day Adventists. Or it could be Sunday, as it is for Catholics and Protestants. 
But the main thing is that in each of these meetings, they do over and over and over the same things, after which they all go back to living just like everybody else, in particular working for money instead of working for God. Evidence they've not even met Jesus Christ because their religion is all about which day of the week they're, they keep holy so they can keep the rest of them unholy and make a religion out of, out of it. Jesus, on the other hand, had no meetings, but he did live together with his disciples. And by doing this, he showed the world this amazing kingdom of heaven. You know, Jesus and his little band of gypsies wandering around the countryside, no billings to meet in, you know, no schedule for services, no rituals to perform. It was just Jesus talking to people who were willing to listen to what he had to say. It wasn't evidence to billings or rituals or public meetings, but their lifestyle showed them. That's the key word in this verse here. It showed them the good news of the kingdom of God. And that's what we need today. We need a, a group of people who can show the kingdom of God to the rest of the world, the way Jesus did and the way the early Christians did. We see here that the early Christians sold their possessions and goods, parted them to everyone as each one had need, and they lived together, sharing everything in common. They could see, uh, the, the public could see by their lives that they really did love one another. And they really did spend their time working for God. You can't see that in, in the, uh, the churches today. You just see a, a bunch of people on one day a week getting together for a meeting and then it's right back to the grind. So for these early Christians, their whole life was a sermon. Wherever they went, People took notice. Daily, in the temple, and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Where is that happening today? The Bible says that we should never, we never should have stopped living like that. And yet it's, it's happened. You know, the church has gotten right away from that. It goes on to say that this lifestyle that the early Christians had is going to be much more important now we need to get back to that lifestyle as the day of the Lord draws near. Now, in case you have any, any problem with the verses on your screen, the word assembling doesn't mean putting up some chairs in a hall and, and sitting for an hour listening to a sermon. Assembly meant living. Do not forsake the living of yourselves together, as the manner of some is. Over and over, Jesus would get into trouble because he didn't behave like the religious leaders wanted him, him to behave on the holy days. He treated every day the same. And he said that what he taught was more important than the holy days. Once again, he was arguing in defense of this invisible kingdom of God. No buildings, no rituals, no public displays of piety, no outward signs of one's spiritual condition. Just love for God and love for others. The reason Jesus could do this was that his new kingdom was one where every day is a holy day, where his followers stopped working for money permanently and they just worked for God. How do you make one day special when every day is holy? So in these four ways, that's through the buildings, through uh, emphasis on health, through rituals and sacraments, and through uh, holy days. What religion had to offer was not enough. In fact, it was moving people in the wrong direction. They needed to turn around and start doing it God's way. There are other things which we could discuss uh, that uh, characterize religion, you know, the way people dress, whether it's a Salvation Army uniform or, um, you know, Mennonite clothes or, or fancy robes or whatever it is. Um, uh, 
whether it's giving special honors and titles to leaders and all the emphasis being on who is your leader, who is your leader, personality cults, or whether it's engaging in endless debates about theology with churches everywhere, putting up their seminaries as though if we can just get them through that seminary, we'll get them into heaven. All of these things happen in religions around the world, but they mean very little to those of us who have discovered the magical, mystical, invisible kingdom of heaven. We who have listened to Jesus, we are waiting for a new world that the Bible says will come down out of heaven where God rules and where we all glorify his name. You know, we pray the Lord's prayer, but how much do we think about it? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, and it concludes on a, a similar note, that all the power and the glory will be to Jesus. It's his kingdom. It's Jesus who needs to be glorified. It's Jesus's power that needs to be seen. You know, I, I see people saying, okay, I'll, I'll obey Jesus as long as he gives me power so I can do miracles. No, it's not like that. Let's obey Jesus so he can have power and he can do what he wants to do. This kingdom of heaven will not be characterized by buildings, by theology, by religious rituals, by public displays of piety, but it will be characterized by the presence of the Lamb of God, who alone can take away the sins of the world. The Bible says that those of us who follow this Lamb, wherever he goes, we will inherit that wonderful, invisible kingdom. So. Let the world, including the religious institutions calling themselves the church, have their religion. Me, I'm going to hold on for, for and hold out for the wonderful kingdom of heaven instead. The kingdom that will be ruled by the king of kings and the prince of peace forever and ever. Amen. Now it's your turn to write some questions and comments about what you've been thinking as you've been listening. I can't see that any have come in so far. Oh, yes, there's one. Question here from Jerry. When Jesus said, I have not come to abolish the law or the prophets, did he mean that every restriction and requirement from the Old Testament, that's the first covenant, is retained under the new covenant? Okay, I could have pretty well predicted this one was going to come up because it comes up over and over. <laughs> Listen, follow Jesus, okay? He's the son of God. I'm sorry to be a little bit impatient about this, but follow Jesus. That's what we hear about is following Jesus. And yet every time we bring up half a verse, that's what that is, Jerry, is half a verse about abolishing the law of the prophets. We seem to overlook the other half. Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets. And if he didn't fulfill them, we're in big trouble. But everybody wants to get us back to the Old Testament, back to not eating uh, prawns, because somehow that's going to make us more spiritual. And that's really what God's all about. The restrictions of the Old Testament uh, were improved on and fulfilled in Jesus. I don't know how to, how to say this, because it just keeps coming up so many times. Jesus is Jesus. <laughs> you know? uh, He's not Moses, okay? The Bible says the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus. Why do we keep pushing to get back to the Old Testament, to the law and the prophets? When Jesus said he's, he's the fulfillment of that, the law and the prophets, we're not offering animal sacrifices anymore. So should we keep preaching it? Okay, because they go on and say, not one jot or one tittle of that law is going to perish until it's all fulfilled. Why aren't we teaching them? For people to offer sacrifices. It's been fulfilled, hasn't it? It's been fulfilled in the, in the death of Jesus on the cross, and it's been fulfilled in his teachings. You know, we don't have to worry about thou shalt not kill. Jesus said, don't get angry. You follow Jesus, and you're going you're gonna to keep the law. And that includes the fourth one, okay, which is always the next question after that one. Well, <laughs> I think I scared anyone else off from asking a question. 
Okay, the fourth commandment, while we're waiting, is, uh, in case anyone's not aware of this, is, is uh, keeping the Sabbath day holy, okay? Which was something I mentioned in here. And uh, that's what people want to go back to. If you want to go back to one day a week holiness, all right, go back to it. But don't tell me that it's what Jesus was all about. Jesus came to teach seven day a week holiness. Now, that may be just empty talk in churches that continue to work for money six days a week and then keep the wrong day holy. I'll agree with the Seventh-day Adventists. Yeah, Saturday is the right day. If you're only going to give one day to God, make it Saturday. But what Jesus really wants is for us to give every day to God. And that's why the Fourth Commandment has been fulfilled. Okay, we have another question. Sharon says, I eat a lot of pork, but now I'm hearing that eating pork is a sin. <laughs> is this true, and should I stop eating it? No, it's not a sin. Listen to Jesus, okay? Jesus said, it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. It's what comes out of your heart. Jesus is the fulfillment. Now, you want to be a, a, a good Jew? Go ahead. Stop eating pork. Stop eating all kinds of things. But you won't be a Christian. Okay? Being a Christian means following Jesus. That's the message that we're trying to get through in this channel. Let's be Christians. Let's stop being all these other things. Paulians and Mosesians, or however we would might pronounce it. Let's follow Jesus. Jesus didn't say anything about eating pork. And we see in the New Testament where uh, Peter was commanded, he was commanded to eat unclean things, snakes and creeping things. Why? Because God was starting something new where it's not about our health. You know, it's about loving other people. You know, crucifixion is really bad for your health. And, and Jesus is asking us to lay down our lives for other people. I don't know I mean we should be eating ourselves to death with, with obesity, but I'm saying that uh, it's, it's not the morality thing, it's a health thing. And health is different from morality. Well, that's uh, all the questions we have at the moment. And I think the address is nice and clear up there now. AvidModerator1 at gmail.com. This, um, this business of um, the Old Testament law, we have a, a, a video coming out, I think in the next week or so, um, to help us understand the difference between um, being a Jew, okay, that's the kingdom of Israel, and being a Christian, that's the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so it just kind of flows on from some of the things I've been saying this morning. Um, but, oh my goodness, it's hard. It's very hard to get people to... Uh, to listen to that and to really think it through. Okay, now we have a comment here uh, from Schnarkel. Uh, he has the reference Acts 10, 9 to 15. Did we have that up there? Uh, that would be the story about Peter. Okay, yeah, you posted this passage, but you did not post the interpretation of Peter's vision. Peter revealed the interpretation of his vision to Cornelius' household. Could you tell me where you find anything about eating garbage in his interpretation? Or is his interpretation incorrect? While I have no desire to persuade people on what they should put into their body, I do find it disturbing to hear people suggest that Jesus or any of his disciples were inclined to or encouraging people to sin. Now look, Snarkle, <laughs> God told Peter to eat some unclean food. That's what God told him to do. That's not sin. Sin is disobedience to God is what it really is. Okay, when God speaks through his son, or God spoke to Peter in this vision, he did it. That's what we should do. There's the, the quote that Schnarkel's given us in verse 28, Acts chapter 10. He said unto them, You know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Schnarkel says, I applaud your desire to encourage people to look at what Jesus or Scripture says. However, I would like to encourage you to see what Scripture says as well. You assume 
that Peter could associate with Gentiles by eating what they were eating, rather than just sitting down and eating with them. Jesus associated with prostitutes. Are you going to suggest that Jesus engaged the services as well? You're misreading what Jesus is saying in the passage from Mark. Jesus says the desires of the heart are what defiles, not washing. And I'm just trying to process it, what, what Schnarkel's getting at here. And I guess what he's saying is that when God said for Peter to eat unclean food, he wasn't really talking about eating unclean food. He was talking about bringing along some kosher food with him while he sits down to eat with unclean people. Is that what you're saying, Schnarkel? As I said, it's a stubborn issue, and people will not let go of it. And yet, you know, if you just, you, you know, you don't have to destroy it. You don't have to um, rip it out of the Bible, but just kind of cover up, cover up the Old Testament long enough to listen to Jesus and look at Jesus, study his life, his ministry, and listen to what he was saying about this wonderful kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom of Israel. Okay, there was a kingdom of Israel. You could give a lot of scripture that says God established that kingdom. But he did a new thing in the New Testament with a new prophet, his son. We just cover up the Old Testament long enough to let Jesus be heard. You're not going to hear Jesus saying, don't eat pork because it's a sin. You're going to hear Jesus say, it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. Okay, I suppose it's figuratively talking about your mouth being not who you sit next to. No, Jesus was clear about it. Health was just health. Even in the Old Testament, that's all it ever was. If people would just get that straight, then maybe they could get their hearts fixed up. Uh, the question was about the prostitute. You know, should we uh, uh, engage in prostitution? No, prostitution is a sin, okay? You see anything in the teachings of Jesus that says, yes, we should engage in prostitution? He associated with prostitutes. But he also associated with people who ate and drank, and he ate and he drank with them. You know, he didn't sneak in kosher food. So there's a difference, big difference, between prostitution and eating pork. And Jesus really wanted us to understand that. Um, now, Susan says, I'm wondering why you don't just en enable chat on YouTube during this live broadcast instead of us having to go to email to ask questions or give a comment. Well, that has been discussed a bit um, in, uh, in one of our chats, might have been in a private chat, and, and people have said that they, on the whole, they, they prefer it this way. We try it both ways. Um, mostly, I find, I mean, most people know that the internet has a lot of trolls, okay? People that simply go around trying to, to disrupt um, meetings. You know, it's like somebody just walking into, into church meetings or walking into council meetings and just shouting and hollering and throwing tables around doesn't contribute uh, to the, the smooth flow of the meeting. The trolls <laughs> hate it when they cannot be heard because they want to be able to shout without any kind of censorship. Well, it, it didn't work. You know, we had people uh, uh, just total confusion. Even the people who wanted to share were talking over top of one another, uh, particularly when you get a lot of people. You've got 100 people all trying to share something at once, and, and they're pouring in at the moment. You see, uh, through email, finally, it's started to flow. Well, it's better if we can take them one at a time. And yeah, we do. I, I don't read out the ones who want to come and tell me you know, how much they hate me or something like that, but we, we have the opportunity. Okay. We've got one from Felipe here, a comment. Uh, Felipe says, as far as food goes, Jesus was quite, quite clear that there is nothing that goes into our mouth that can make us unclean. In, Ma in Mark chapter 7, he has a passage printed out here. He said unto them, are you so without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever from without enters into the man it cannot defile him because it does not enter into his heart. It goes into the belly and goes out into the draft, purging all meats. And he said, that which comes out of the man, that defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, 
adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and follow the man. So we have to believe what Jesus says, that nothing from outside that enters us can defile us, or we believe everyone else who insists that certain foods can defile us. Who are you going to believe? Thank you, Felipe. Just uh, mark that as red. And... We've lost one here. Uh, this is another one from Flip. I'll just leave that for now. I'm looking for uh, Samantha. Let's be comment there from her. Let's see, it must be this one. Uh, no, this is uh, from uh, someone named Kyle. It says, Hi, voice. In answer to the person who said we should not eat the food of non-Jews, Jesus taught his disciples to eat anything that was given to them when he sent them out. People may argue that he was just sending them to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but he also commanded his disciples to go into the whole world, teaching people to observe the things that he commanded. This confirms that when Jesus said, eat whatever is set before you, he meant eat whatever is set before you. Thank you for that comment. I better mark that as red. Okay, I can't find this other comment I was told to look for. I'm going missing. No, not up there. Okay. Um, Okay, this is Samantha. There she is. She says, hi, have you got any videos about the Trinity yet? It is an issue that still bugs me, and it's hard to find conclusive answers. Is Jesus actually God, or closer to the Jehovah's Witness view? No, uh, Samantha, once again, I don't have any videos on that. In the, the study that we just had, the, the, the talk I gave about the difference between the kingdom of heaven and religion, the last point I made was that religions become involved in theology. Now, theology is the study of God, not obedience to God. Nothing to do with obedience to God. Theology has to do with putting God up on the operating table and dissecting him. To me, that's what the whole Trinity argument is all about. doesn't matter which side you're on, it's not going to get you into heaven. And if your heart's right, it's not going to keep you out of heaven. God does not give you a theology test at the Golden Gates. What God wants to know is where's your heart? Now, I personally believe that Jesus is equal to God. Uh, I could say God. He certainly, according to uh, John chapter 1, was there in the beginning when the world was made. It says the word was God. So, yeah, Jesus is God. But I don't have a problem with sharing with people who, who, you know, maybe could just say he's a great prophet. You know, even Muslims say that. And I've found that when people just take the time to listen to the prophet, then everything changes. Everything works out. Okay, the disciples didn't, didn't have their theology worked out. They weren't even sure he was the Messiah for a while. But they still listened to him. And that's what's not happening. People are not listening to Jesus. They're too busy getting into these side issues like the Trinity. The Trinity, I don't, I don't think there's anyone that understands the Trinity. It's a word that was made up because it does seem to be kind of a contradiction. Sometimes Jesus says, you know, my father's greater than me. And obviously his father was God. And then other times he says, if you've seen me, you've seen my father. So how do you put those two things together? And, and, and somebody just said, well, why don't we say they're both right? And that's basically what the Trinity teaching says. Then you get people who emphasize just the one side where it says he is God, and the other side where he says, you know, I can do nothing of myself. I am the son of man. And so then we have to say, well, he's absolutely human, but he's absolutely God. And it goes round and round, and it gets you nowhere, really, nowhere at all. Um. 
Bradle has says, do you meditate on God or do you see praying to God and meditating on him as the same thing? Uh, those are the only two options, Bradle. <laughs> what about it being something different? Um, I think that, that there are many ways in which we pray. Um, that uh, I like saying the Lord's Prayer and I like thinking about what it says and changing it to my own words each time so that it's it's new and fresh each time. Um, but I also just think sometimes, wake up in the middle of the night, had a wonderful time uh, last night, in the middle of the night, just thinking about God, thinking about this whole concept of the kingdom of heaven and talking it over a little bit with him. And, and as I talk to God about things, um, it seems like a lot of the, the confusions and the frustrations of my life uh, kind of loosen up and unravel, and uh, he starts putting things into shape. So there's so many different ways that a person can pray. But it is communicating with God. I think a very big part of, uh, of a prayer is listening, and you may call it meditating. I just see this as clearing your mind, let, giving God a chance to say something if he's got something to say, and uh, offering ourselves to, as obedient servants, to act in whatever he tells us. Uh, says uh, Stephen says, no questions from here at the moment, but thank you for your thoughts. Uh, I do so love having the opportunity to hear the word of God taken seriously and discussed with love. Okay, hope we're in agreement on, on who the word of God is, Stephen. Thank you for that. Carlos, you are teaching living as Jesus did. Great. <laughs> Here it comes. And then keeping four commandments as he did is also something relevant. The fourth commandment is to be active even in the future kingdom by the way the kingdom of heaven comes after Jesus' second coming. How do you say it is invisible at this moment? Not sure what that last point is, but okay, here it is again. The fourth commandment, the fourth commandment. Carlos, what about the 11th commandment? You know, love God with all your heart. And love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, are you going to you gonna love your God and your neighbor on Saturday and forget about him on Sunday? You know, that's that's the actual teaching of the, the fourth commandment um, fanatics. They actually teach it's sinful. It's sinful to worship God on Sunday. Ask them. If it's the Seventh-day Adventist, they teach us the mark of the beast. It'll send you to hell if you worship God on Sunday. You know, I mean, that's laughable to me, really. I like to have respect for, for differences between Christians, but how can anyone tell you that God's going to send you to hell for worshiping him because it's the wrong day? They've got the wrong cornerstone. Let's get the cornerstone back. Okay, I'll say it again, what I've said, and obviously you haven't been listening, Carlos. Jesus said to work for God every day. My Father works every day, and so do I. And he told his disciples, stop working for mammon, and take my yoke upon you, and enter into my Sabbath. So what the word Sabbath means is rest. But Jesus was promoting his rest. All right, and if you want to keep Saturday holy, that's wonderful. But it's much better to move into the Old Testament and keep every day holy. I'm uh, sorry, I said Old Testament, New Testament. Move into the New Testament. Okay, Frank says, I just tuned in. A lot of the questions I've heard asked can be answered if everyone would just read the first four Gospels. There you go. You don't have to be here long to see something like that. Good for you, Frank. When or oh, when are the people coming to these chats going to start reading the four Gospels? You know, if we had some way <laughs> to, to, to stand at the door, you know, and lock out anyone we don't want here, I'd say, well, if you haven't read the four Gospels, go back and read them. And when you're finished, then you can come. Because people just, you know, say, say things off the top of their heads that indicate they've never listened to Jesus. Cowan says, I remember reading when Jesus talks to the Samaritan and when his disciples come back to Jesus and they say to him, here, please eat. But Jesus says, thank you, but I should eat from what the Father has given me and from the work I do for him. That's what feeds me. What are your thoughts? I think that what Jesus was talking about there, uh, Cowan, was uh, not that he had some kosher food to eat or 
or maybe that he had some pork to eat. I'm not sure. The disciples, I suppose, would have been bringing some good food, although the Samaritans maybe didn't follow the uh, the Jewish health rules. But I don't think it had anything to do with uh, about real food. Jesus was saying, "My my meat is to do the will of God." And so he was he was uh, that excited about what was happening. You know, something big was happening in that village, and the woman was running off and getting her friends to come. And uh, the disciples just uh, could see that excitement in Jesus and a little bit worried about him and thought, you know, we, we need to give him something to eat. So I think the uh, situation at the well was not about uh, food, clean or unclean food. Okay, Christian has two questions. Do you prefer the King James Version or do you find any other versions interpreted well? I always come back to the King James Version, and the reason for that is because it's the only version of the Bible that's not copyrighted. You know, when you copyright something, it's primarily so that you can make money from it, you know, that you can sell it and other people cannot sell it. Um, and if you're going to make money from something, you want to you make something that people want to hear. You know? um, the King James Version is not like that. Okay? And uh, even though it has its problems, Okay, it's not, I, no way do I think that's the one Jesus used or that it's infallible. It's not infallible at all. But the King James Version um, is, is there, I think, kind of to um, get us back on the track. When I read something in a, a modern translation that seems a little bit strange, I immediately go to the King James Version to see how it started out and what they came up with. Up with. Sometimes the, the modern translation is a great improvement. So uh, from day to day, I'll, I'll usually read... Uh, moment of reading the contemporary English version because it is easier to read and it in you know a slight change in wording can help us to, to see a passage in a new light but I still refer back to the King James James version um, and Christian asks is this a good email to send questions to even after this meeting ends yes you can send questions uh, to this email address it's the, the uh, official communication address address between uh, listeners and uh, myself or Sister T, who answers a lot of the mail. Okay, uh, Lynn says, should we keep the feasts and attend a Messianic congregation? <sighs> Lynn, have you read the four Gospels? You see, in the Gospels, we read that Jesus was a Jew, and he did uh, the things that a Jew does as he was growing up even to the point of being baptized, despite the fact that he was the sinless son of God. And after that baptism, he said, well, we fulfilled all righteousness. We've done everything the Old Testament says. From then on, he began to preach the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom of Israel. The kingdom of Israel had feasts, and Jesus was living in Israel, and so he would attend the feast as a form of outreach. A messianic congregation. Messianic. Let's see, Messiah means Christ, so that would be Christian. Congregation is some people together. Should we be part of Christians together? Yes. Okay. So wherever two or three Christians are gathered together, that must be a Messianic congregation. So yes, I agree with you on that. Now Lynn has another question. How do you quiet your mind? And that's probably in relation to a very brief comment I made about listening when we pray. And believe me, it's, it's not that easy not in today's world and not particularly uh, with the busyness that so many of us have. You know, we can even be out in the country, but still be full of busy busyness. And so it takes a lot of practice to just uh, be quiet before God, to let all those thoughts get out of the way. Um, but it, it, for my, my experience anyway, it's almost like falling asleep, you know, that you are simply uh, asking God to speak to you, asking God to clear out all your own biases and thoughts. And very often, and when that happens, just at some point where you're about to fall off to sleep, you have a dream or a vision. And if you're able to wake yourself back up from that, then you can pray and ask God, well, what was that that you were saying? Some words may come into your head. That's, that's how I find it. Uh, definitely quieting your mind. Uh, it doesn't always have to go to that point, but sometimes it's just talking things over with God, you know, uh, something that you're, you're struggling with, you know, like I was doing this pretty heavy talking with God about the whole business of the kingdom of heaven in the middle of the night, because I thought, well, God, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching things that sometimes I'm not practicing myself. 
you know, this thing about buildings. I was just a couple of weeks ago saying to people, oh, you know, it'd be great if we had a, a building in the, the U.S. where um, mobile outreach teams could all come and meet together. <laughs> so, oh, no. Oh, no. There we are back into a church again. You know, um, And so I tried to discuss some of those things with God. And, and it, it was uh, a good time of just uh, opening up to him and letting God say what, what he wants to say. Um, now, here's a question that's in the subject line. I guess it's all there. This isn't much of a question, but what if we assumed, since Jesus knew all things, that he wanted us to eat unclean things to strengthen our immune system? Uh, good good uh, little thought there. Possibly. But I, I think it still goes back to the concept that what God ultimately wants to do is to have a lot of healthy people around, you know. So we can, uh, you know, we can advertise that Christianity is good for your health. And uh, I don't really think that's what it was about. You know, Christianity is about laying down your life for one another. I honestly think that if we serve God, we're going to live shorter lives. You know, Jesus only lasted for three years. Uh, I've probably lasted as long as I have, I have because I've compromised too much on what Jesus said. Another question from uh, Closer to Home. Hi, boys. The first thing Jesus taught in Matthew is that, <laughs> gosh, is this a, a record somebody's putting up there? Is that he did not come to destroy the law or the prophets. Can you explain that, please? If, if we got a, you know, a, uh, a Hebrew Roots uh, branch outside the, the door here, did they announce, go to this chat and preach this over and over? Okay, so I'll say it again. Um, uh, it may be getting boring for some people, but it looks like you Hebrew Roots guys haven't haven't heard the message yet. Read the rest of the verse. He didn't just say he didn't come to destroy the law of the prophets. All right, suppose, you know, somebody has got, um, you know, uh, a medication that they use when they have a cold or the flu, you know, and it, it, it works a bit. But you've got one that they can take, and it's going to just knock that flu on the head in two minutes. Okay, just super powerful medication but you go to them and they they've been selling this other medicine for so long and it's the best thing out there best thing on the market you know for dealing with the symptoms and, and helping you to get through and and you you know they're going to be upset I said look i'm not coming here to put down what you're doing i've just come here with something better Can you understand that that's what jesus was doing i'm not coming here to put down what you're doing, I've just come to fulfill what all that other stuff was about. So what he says in Matthew, I didn't come to destroy the law of the prophets, but I came to fulfill it. Okay? He goes on to say, true, that, that the law and the prophets will not pass away until they've all been fulfilled. And they have all been fulfilled in Jesus. Simple as that. And the, the contradiction, if you want to continue on with the passage, is that even the Hebrew roots people have stopped. They've stopped offering sacrifices. Hey, that's in the Torah. The Torah says offer sacrifice. Why aren't you offering sacrifices? Jesus didn't come to destroy that. You've broken that law and that jot and that tittle. No, they're not, they're not following it. Why? Because Jesus fulfilled it. And if we'll listen to Jesus, we'll find out he's fulfilled everything else as well. Okay, that's why it's uh, it's not destroyed, it's just fulfilled, replaced, if you like. All right, Tina says, my whole life, I think the Lord has been calling on me. This is, uh, this is a question. When I was young, I went to church. Then they wanted to baptize me, and I ran <laughs> I've always known deep inside that if you commit to God, you cannot be a Sunday Christian. These fast, past few months, I've found myself in the Lord's Word and praying every day. In February, I think the Holy Spirit came on me. It was the most joy I've ever felt in my life. Since then, I've been on fire for the Lord, but still I'm fighting sin. I wonder if it's the Holy Spirit working on me or not. How do you know if the Holy Spirit is with you and talking to you? Also, doesn't God use each one of us to his will? Well, we have free will, uh, for one thing, Tina. And so 
um, God would like to use each one of us to do his will. You know, it's like when we pray the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done. But even saying that doesn't necessarily mean his will is going to be done if we don't yield our will to his. Okay, that's that's the last comment. The, the rest is harder to answer, and that's about the Holy Spirit. And I don't think that anybody really has it figured out. I think it's a part of this whole mystery of the kingdom of heaven because the Holy Spirit is invisible. And everybody wants to uh, make the Holy Spirit visible. It's like when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus and said to Nicodemus that he had to be born of the Spirit. He compared the Spirit to the wind. He says the wind blows wherever it wants to blow. And nobody can tell where it's going or where it's coming from. Even the scientists today, we can see certain air streams, but we can't predict them, you know, not, not with certainty because it's too way too complicated. But they call it the butterfly effect. You know, one butterfly could change the whole thing. If it's done at the right time, in the right place, the whole stream can change. And so it is with the Holy Spirit. You, you can't tell where the Holy Spirit's coming from, where the Holy Spirit's going, or even who's definitely got the Holy Spirit. I think for many of us, we, we are moving in the Spirit at times, and we're out of the Spirit at other times. But... You will find, as you study religion, that various groups will come up with various theories about who has the Holy Spirit. So somebody will say, well, when, when they're christened as a little child, as a baby, they receive the Holy Spirit. Or when they confirm that, or in baptism, when they're baptized with water, then they receive the Holy Spirit. Some say that when you uh, speak in tongues, then you have the Holy Spirit. None of these uh, definitions has worked successfully in any situation. Um, probably the best guide uh, comes from Galatians, where Paul says that the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. So it's good long this there. But even there, people can... Uh, uh, say, do and say things that sound very loving and really not be loving because, again, you can't see their hearts. So this is a mystery that only God can see. As you seek to be uh, open to God, to be hungry for the truth, to be humble enough to be, be taught, to be honest about your, uh, your own mistakes and things, um, I believe God's Spirit will continue to work with you again and again. It's just that the... Uh, Holy Spirit is not something that is all or nothing. You know, I have it now, okay, so now I don't have to worry about, uh, you know, what I do and what I say. Uh, or somebody else doesn't have it, and so they're bad people. Just keep serving God to the best of your ability. Keep praying for more of his spirit. It says, thy kingdom come, you know, and the Holy Spirit is, is what that kingdom is about. That God's kingdom might come in your heart. His will might be done in your life. Uh, now, it seems like we're going to have two questions here. Uh, can you, oh, no, it's just appears twice. Can you please tell me your take on the lost Gospels of Christ? For instance, the Gnostic Gospels and why they are demonized. I'm in a very confusing place in my Christian life pertaining to what teachings of Christ are true and which are not. Some of the Gnostic Gospels have ignited a flame in my heart in my search for truth. Much love, and please continue what you're doing, from Shane. I haven't had the time, Shane, to actually study those other Gospels. Um, I've heard that there's some really good things in them. Um, same as I've, I've had a quick look at, you know, some of the apocryphal books in the, in the Catholic Bible, and there's some good stuff in there as well. The thing is that we, we have uh, four Gospels on which there's pretty widespread agreement that they are reliable, and I don't see anybody following those four. So I, I'm, I'm hardly looking for more. And I guess I would be a little bit skeptical if any of these other Gospels are outright contradicting what Jesus taught in the four Gospels we already have. So is it really that we need more Gospels or do we need more obedience to what we've already been told? Think about that one. Okay, Tasha has said, hey, voice, awesome stream as usual. This world is a dark place. Many reject the truth, which is following Jesus. Why do so many people that say they are Christians 
hate others who are actually doing what Jesus says. Well, Tasha, you just have to read the Gospels. <laughs> You'll see how, why did so many people who said they were good Jews, you know, children of faith, children of Abraham, hate Jesus and actually literally kill him, tortured him to death. You know, this concept uh, of the, the hate that Jesus received for, for many churchgoers today, it's it's like a fairy tale, you know. I mean, they just can't believe that, you know, um, anyone today would ever act that way if Jesus was around. That anyone would, I mean, they may not be like and agree with everything that Jesus said, but nobody's going to go and kill them. That's, that's the, what the average person in the church and in the world would think today. But I tell you, I tell you, when you start listening to Jesus, when you start trying to obey him, and we're still, when you start teaching other people to obey him, it stirs up some pretty awful stuff, really awful. You know, and uh, I have friends who've been attacked. Uh, one was almost uh, kicked to death because he was teaching the teachings of Jesus. I've had uh, uh, people campaign around the world uh, to take me out, to have me uh, eliminated in one way or another uh, because of teaching the teachings of Jesus. It's part of the reason why I'm anonymous. When you start teaching the teachings of Jesus, you stir up something. Okay, and often the ones who are stirred up the most, and you know, there's, there's uh, almost certainly some on this forum this morning, um, who had started by saying, this is wonderful, this is great, I wanna, I wanna do this. And then they started counting the cost. Okay, and the cost got a bit, a bit much, a bit more than they were prepared to pay. But you know, they don't just sort of walk off and say, oh, okay, well, I guess not, change your mind, I'll go do something else. They can't do that, you see, because in their heart, they know that what's being said here is true. They can't just walk away from it uh, neutral, indifferent anymore. They have to walk off angry. Okay, and this is happening nearly every day now, because we've had hundreds of people writing in, and, and nearly daily, somebody will turn around and have a firing shot, you know, as they go away. Yeah, well, you just censored, you know, you won't let us go on the comments and, and tell every, the world how we disagree with you, you know. Um, uh, you're, you're, you're authoritarian, you're not loving in the things you're saying, you know. Um, always has to be something, something to put down uh, what is being said, because it's convicting. The teachings of Jesus are convicting. They are the answer to the problems of the world, you know, but if people are not going to listen to them, you know, and, and I should think that sooner or later, we're going to find that these uh, 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 Fourth Commandment people are the worst, the worst enemies if they don't break down and fall on the rock of the teachings of Jesus, they're going to be the worst enemies. And I'll give you an example of that in very real practical terms. Right now, it's happening. Which denomination in the world today is most outspokenly and aggressively telling the world, you can take the mark of the beast, it won't hurt you? Uh, and by that, I'm talking about a mark in your hand or your forehead that you use for buying and selling, exactly the way the Bible says it. The Seventh-day Adventist is producing video after video after video all over YouTube, telling people, you can take that. It's not the mark of the beast. Now, that's unbelievable, coming from a group that is supposedly experts on Bible prophecy. Why? Well, because it didn't fit with what they were saying. They had for many, many years taught that the worship on Sunday was the mark of the beast. You know, they still put out stuff about their secret laws somewhere in the United States that uh, are, are about to be enforced, saying that everybody has to worship God on Sunday. It's absolute, total myth. No way the devil's ever going to make a law telling you you have to worship God. But these are the people who are fighting aggressively and hatefully against the teaching that's right there in the Bible, in black and white, clear as anything, no, no symbolism or seminars necessary to understand it, that if you put that mark in your hand and you use it for buying and selling, you're, you're cursing yourself to hell forever. You know, you cross the line, of no, a point of no return. That's just an example in that respect. Um, the churches will be the ones, uh, over and over I've had this happen, who report you to the authorities. There's somebody down there in the street passing out literature without permission. Send the council down, have you arrested. It'll be church people over and over again. So you're saying, why do they hate each other? Because 
they know that what Jesus said is the truth and they're not prepared to do it. And, and that uh, goes for a lot of people right here listening to this chat right now. They know that what's, what's been said in this chat is true. I know that they're going to do it or they're going to hate the people that do. I'm not sure. Okay, this says I'm French, so I apologize uh, for my script of speaking. Last year, the Lord visited me three times in different ways when I was listening to a CD of teaching and I was worshiping. While I was listening, I imagine he wants he want me to die. So I told him that I give him my life. So if he wants me to die, it's okay. What do you think about it? Well, I mean, ultimately, Jesus has asked for all of us to be willing to offer our lives for him, to lay down our lives, to take up our cross, to follow him. Um, and so if that's what if that's what you're talking about, and God's asked you to be willing to die for him, that's fine thing is that in uh, personal revelations, I think it's important for us to also listen to godly counsel, as, as you're doing here now, uh, to share these things with other Christians. Uh, there are other ways to know God's will. If you write to the address uh, that you've just written to, we can send you an article called Eight Ways to Know God's Will. And God's able to speak to us through many different ways. Sometimes we get into trouble as Christians if we only know one way to find God's will. When there, there are others. And uh, his will will not always be 100% black and white, crystal clear. Sometimes we just have to uh, stumble along the best we can. And uh, that's where faith comes into it. You know, it's just trust that this seems to be the way God's leading. So keep listening, uh, but listen in many different ways. Um, okay, whoops, that's one I've already read. Oh, I see there's more. I <laughs> didn't scroll down. Okay, this is one um, from Felipe. In the Old Testament, God dealt with people differently, teaching spiritual truths through physical examples. There was a physical tabernacle or temple. There was a physical death penalty to various sin serious sins. There were physical health rules, a physical, visible people of God, the Jews, or the Hebrews, a day of the week when people rested physically, and a physical circumcision as a sign of being part of God's people. However, the New Testament reveals that those things were a shadow of things to come. Okay? That being that you could see in those things uh, some hint about what, what was coming, this new kingdom that was coming. We are now the spiritual temple and tabernacle of God. Jesus speaks of a spiritual death penalty that comes as a result of sin. And about the seriousness of our spiritual health. We are a spiritual people of God that cannot be identified by race or nationality. And our rest or Sabbath comes through Jesus as a spiritual rest from our own works as we live in obedience to God. And the circumcision that God does in us is the circumcision of our heart, not our foreskins. It's sad that people want to go back to the superficial understanding of God's will when Jesus has come to fulfill it in himself and in us. Thank you, Felipe, for expressing that so well <laughs> and without me ranting and raving. Um, the fact is, I guess, that those same people who were offended when Jesus said it the first time are probably going to offended, be offended by hearing it again in this day and age. All right, uh, Frank says, I understand John 1. Okay, that's one where it says Jesus is the word. And Matthew, Jesus says, the Father is greater than me. I don't understand the Trinity fully. Well, welcome to the club, Frank. I understand uh, the concept. I've watched long debates over this topic, and both sides bring good points. Jesus is the word of God. Therefore, I think he is an entity of God, as a separate being. He is the Son of God. I've prayed about it and don't have a full understanding of it yet. Trust me, Frank, nobody does, okay? Everybody pretends, or a lot pretend they do, but nobody does. 
You know, that's the whole thing. That God is incomprehensible. He's beyond our understanding, so far above us. What are your thoughts on praying? Jesus gives us the Lord's Prayer that gives us an example of how to pray to the Father. Do we pray to Jesus the same way, or do we pray to the Father through the name of Jesus Christ? Oh, my goodness. Again, we get into a, a theological thing here. Oh, you think it matters. You really think it matters. I mean, God's up there. You know, what language should we pray in? You know, maybe God won't understand English or French or German or whatever we speak. Maybe we should all learn Hebrew so we can say it in the same language that the Hebrews spoke. That's the way people get thinking when they're trying to work out all these theological issues. Um, I know for myself, sometimes I'm praying to God, sometimes I'm praying to Jesus. So that's, that's heresy as far as some people are concerned. Um, look, God's able to see our hearts. And he's not in some competition with the sun. You know, there's not that competition that uh, religion wants to make it into. And uh, I, yeah, I definitely think the Lord's Prayer is very helpful. Um, I know it can seem like a ritual, you know, if, if we're just uh, reciting it and not thinking about what it says. And it's uh, do the Our Father 100 times. And, uh, not like that, but, you know, Jesus gave it for a reason. He wants us to understand the kind of things that we should be praying for. Uh, I find sometimes I get, you know, kind of keep a prayer list. People say, can you pray for, you know, this person, can you pray for that person, pray for this situation? And I try to remember them. And then the list just gets too long. And, and so I just go back to what Jesus gave me. Your will be done, God. In every one of these situations, let your will be done. Let your kingdom come. And he covers that, all the things that we really need to pray for in the Lord's Prayer. So on. I, I love it. Uh, Cowan says, I remember just reading about this in the book of Acts the other day, in Acts 2, verses 42 through 47. In those verses, it says the disciples broke bread from house to house. And even in the temples. Uh, does it say they broke bread in the temple or that they were in the temple? I, I would think that they were not eating in the temple. But uh, certainly in those uh, Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, we hear about how the early Christians every day shared together from house to house. Um, and they, they would go to the temple and their outreaches. Richard says, in the Old Testament, there were many names. Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nissi, etc. Jesus called God his father. And the Pharisees said, kill him. Jesus called him his father again. And the Pharisees says, kill him. Jesus is giving us his model prayer, our father. God's new name, and it's for each and every one of us, is father. Okay, that's a, a good answer to all those who want to tell you how to pronounce God's name. I remember uh, hearing a story where people from different religions got together and they were discussing God. And, uh, you know, one of them said, well, in our religion, uh, we call God the great, all-seeing, wise entity or something like that. And then another one says, yeah, well, we, we call him the uh, creator of the vastness of the universe. They went through these various names and then they came to the Christian and said, well, what do you call him? Well, we just call him Father. It's so simple, isn't it? All right, Stephen says, Luke 22, he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and gave unto them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Is Jesus saying that we should keep the Passover? Well, is that what they do during the Passover? Now, it's going to They don't do that in Passover. Okay, uh, um, we're just get, trying to get back into the Old Testament again. The Passover is finished. Jesus is the Lamb. Jesus died for us. Now, we, we might say that passage is talking about us doing some kind of a Christian uh, 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 ceremony to remember Jesus. But, you know, I'm inclined to think it's not even a, a Christian ceremony. It's, it's a reality that we break bread every time we break bread that we should remember that it's Jesus that has provided that bread for us. We're working for him now to, to thank him and remember him every time we eat, every time we drink. Passover? No, it's finished. Uh, 
Okay, Lynn again, please explain what the kingdom of heaven is. Uh, Lynn, I tried, you know, I, that's how this, uh, this whole chat started with a, a very feeble attempt by me to explain something about the kingdom of heaven, that it's this invisible kingdom that Jesus came to build that uh, frustrates every one of us who wants to start a religion. Okay, because it's just, it's, it's invisible. And it's going to stay that way. You know, when Jesus said, it is finished on the cross, that was the end of God's chosen people, visibly. Uh, when you get into studying the, the uh, 70 weeks of Daniel's prophecy, you'll understand this a whole lot more clearly. Because Daniel gives a period, uh, so many weeks up to when the Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. That means that Jesus dies, but doesn't die for himself. He dies for us. And then it just suddenly skips forward to the last seven years. And all that period between the death of Jesus on the cross and the last seven years, there is no visible chosen people. You know, the kingdom of heaven is invisible. And that's where we are right now. And in all the sins of the Catholic churches and all the Protestant churches uh, of every religion in the world can be summed up that we confused the kingdom of heaven with the visible church organization. And that's where we keep getting off the rails. God can use organizations and, and structures to a, an extent, a certain point, but there's limits every time. And being in any organization will not put you in the kingdom of heaven, nor will it put you out. Uh, so then further ask, is the kingdom of heaven something we can see? Uh, I guess probably now you know the answer to that. Can we pray with another comment? It seems people have a special problem with the Ten Commandments. They may believe that Jesus has fulfilled the feasts and the sacrifices. Well, actually, uh, Felipe, the Hebrew roots people don't feel he's even fulfilled the feasts. They want to continue with all of those. But yeah, the, the, uh, a lot of the other Protestant churches would say that. But he has not done away with the Ten Commandments. And in particular, they focus on the fourth, the Sabbath. Jesus did not annul the Sabbath. It's still in effect. He clearly said that it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. He said that it is lawful to work for God on the Sabbath, as the priest did in the Old Testament. No Seventh-day Adventist or Hebrew roots people can argue against that. However, Jesus expanded the Sabbath. As he did, do not murder. He expanded it to do not hate. He expanded do not commit adultery, to do not look at a woman to lust after her. Do not swear falsely, when to do not swear at all. Do not commit idolatry, to do not store up treasure on earth, etc. He expanded the Sabbath to seven days a week. We can work for God every day as Jesus himself and the apostles did. Okay, That does not destroy the fourth commandment, but it fulfills it. There's nothing that Seventh-day Adventists or Hebrew roots movements say against this. It's not a sin to work for God on the Sabbath. It's not a sin to take a rest on a different day of the week if you're tired. So why the big fuss? Quick question from Callan again. Hello, boys. I was wondering, would this be considered an online ministry or an assembly of Christians that are not scared of diving into the true teachings of Jesus and are able to talk to one another, giving better understanding to one another, so we can take that step into starting communities in what Jesus describes in the Gospels? What are your thoughts? Yeah, certainly it's uh, one of the things that uh, uh, is notably different in uh, today's age that Christians are able, through the technology of the Internet, to, as you say, assemble or, or meet together in a way uh, through the Internet and share thoughts. The thing is, that it's not actually assembly. And as I said earlier, putting a bunch of chairs in a room is not actually assembling either. The, the real assembly is where Christians live together. Uh, as you said, uh, this may be the first step in the starting a community where Christians live together. And um, you know, we are, are gradually um, coming up with information from uh, Christians in various locations, which has been helpful in putting a few of them together uh, so that they can get started uh, physically working with one another and, and um, uh, sharing the, the good news with the rest of the world. But even if that continued to grow, you know, as, as some kind of a visible organization, that is not the kingdom of heaven. So the, the church uh, really uh, exists for one purpose, and that purpose is to communicate to people that they don't need the church. Ironic, isn't it?
what we need is the kingdom of heaven. What we need is the teachings of Jesus. Unfortunately, uh, all the organizations I see are not are not teaching that. Hopefully we can teach that as well. As uh, is so badly needed today. Okay, from Kevin. About the other Gospels of Jesus, I was reading a bit of the Gospel of Thomas, the last days, and wanted to share some verses that actually might be very fitting to what you're talking about on the topic of the Kingdom of Heaven. Uh, one thirteen, his disciples said to him, when will the Kingdom come? Jesus said, it will not come by waiting for it. It will not be a matter of saying, here it is, or there it is. Rather, the kingdom of the Father is spread out upon the earth, and men do not see it. And then in parentheses 3, Jesus said, If those who lead you say to you, see, the kingdom is in the sky, then the birds of the sky will precede you. If they say to you, it is in the sea, then the fish will precede you. Rather, the kingdom is inside of you, and it is outside of you. When you come to know yourselves, then you will become known. And you will realize that it is you who are the sons of the living Father. But if you will not know yourselves, you dwell in poverty, and it is you who are that poverty. Since the latter verse may sound a bit mystical, but I think it is about the promise of God to care for us if we seek for the kingdom and damn ourselves if we follow selfish desires. Please keep preaching. Blessings from Germany. This is Kevin in Germany. Okay, I I see all that there in uh, in the Gospels. I think it's in Matthew, uh, where Jesus says much practically word for word the same thing. Okay, this is a question from Stephen. A voice queried whether I was referring to the same God. I use the name, the Word of God. We most certainly are talking about the same one, as in this verse from Revelation. <laughs> okay, thank you, Stephen. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Praise God. Okay, let's be clear when we when we use that because that that name is so often misused. Uh, Patty says, "Could the mark not be the internet? www the World Wide Web." In the Hebrew alphabet, the, the letter W is the number six. Um, I think there are a lot of, uh, you know, kind of like uh, occurrences of the number 666 uh, around the world um, in many different places. I don't know how much of it's coincidence and how much of it is uh, significance, um, but just a couple of points about the WWW thing. And, and uh, it would probably, the first one would relate to just about everything when uh, you come up with a number. The question is, is the internet put in the back of your hand or on your forehead, and do you use it for buying and selling? And is it the only way that people can buy or sell? There may be some aspects of that which will come into play in the future, but um, the, the, the microchip, uh, which is used for uh, identification purposes at the moment, but also in a few experiments being used for buying and selling, uh, can be put in the back of the hand and waved in front of a uh, uh, one of those scanners like they have at the supermarket, uh, and money will be instantly transferred from your account into someone else's account or vice versa. That's Mark. That that fits the, the definition. Okay, just having the number 666 doesn't make something the mark of the beast. Also, bear in mind that WWW in Hebrew means 666, not 600, 60, and 6. Okay, there are three different values. There's the number 6, but then there's 3 score, which is 60, and then there's 600. So, uh, it, it's not just some, uh, you know, magic 666 thing. Uh, Patty says, I have a lot of questions. Sorry, my son is about to make his first communion. I'm having difficulty allowing this as I don't believe in it after growing up a Catholic. What do you think of this? Well, what did Jesus say? You know, Jesus say anything about first communions. I think what your son needs to do is uh, uh, listen to Jesus. And if you're listening to Jesus and sharing that with your son, that's what matters. I don't believe the Catholic Church is uh, getting him to listen to Jesus. Surprisingly, I would say that the Catholic Church probably does a better job of it than the Protestants. I say this because in the Catholic Church, when the Gospels are read, and the Gospels are read every Sunday, uh, the whole church stands 
the, the, the priest kisses the Bible. I mean, all, all these things are just rituals. But what they're trying to say is that when Jesus speaks, that's special. They read from the Old Testament. They read from the epistles. But they read from the, the Gospels every Sunday. And obviously, God has used the church to preserve the Bible all these years. But the bottom line is, uh, are we actually hearing what Jesus said? Is that what is uh, being taught? And are we applying it in our lives today? That's what your son needs, uh, not rituals. Van has asked, uh, hello, I would like to know your thoughts on scriptural inspiration and how this is tied to the view of biblical inerrancy. Okay. Um, it, get a dictionary, look up inspired. Get a dictionary, look up infallible. That's it. Okay. They're two different words. One is not the other. Okay. So scripture can be inspired, but it never made it infallible. It's not there. There's nowhere, anywhere, someone can prove from the Bible that the Bible is infallible. Which, of course, it isn't. You know, it's quite quite clear that it's, it's not infallible. Even the people who preach the uh, biblical inerrancy uh, say, well, actually, it was only the original that was infallible. And we haven't found the original yet, but we believe that it was. And so whenever they, they have a contradiction, well, it was a mistake that crept in somewhere along the line. So it, it's just a theory that really doesn't uh, doesn't amount to anything in practice. So my uh, belief is exactly what the Bible says. The Bible says all scripture is inspired. Now, here's another point to bear in mind. Does the Bible say that everything in the Bible is scripture? Okay. You know, if you've got genealogies, that's good. That's good for records. You know, there's records of how many people were in each family, in each tribe in the Old Testament. Is that profitable for doctrine, for correction, for instruction in righteousness? No, I think it's just a good historical record. It's, it's great that it's there, but it's not scripture. It's not holy writings that are sent there to teach us anything. Same thing when Paul says to Timothy, don't forget to bring my cloak, the one I left at Troas when you come, and the parchments. That's not scripture. That's just Paul writing a note. You know, along with some holy writings, you know, some some inspired things that he said to Timothy along with that. Esteka, I think that is, uh, has written this. First of all, thank you for your profound videos and knowledge, and thank you for the live stream. My name is Esteka from Amsterdam, Holland. Nice, we're getting more people from uh, Europe participating in the, these chats. I wanted to know how you look at the mystical teachings of Jesus in the Gospel of Thomas, and if Jesus, his teachings, uh, were metaphorical, all about inner transformation. I also wanted to know whether the inner teaching of Buddhism equals to the inner teachings of Jesus. I'm hoping for a live response. Well, here I am, as, li as alive as I can get, Chris Decker. Um, Okay, other questions have been asked about other Gospels, and I think my answer would still be much the same, that um, the, the reason given for not including some of these Gospels in the Bible was that they, uh, the, the, the experts felt that they were not quite as reliable as the ones that are there. Um, maybe some of them didn't even, hadn't even been discovered yet, you know, when the, the Bible, as we know it, was put together. I don't see any problem with people reading anything, you know, anything you like, you could read. And if you find something in there that helps you uh, in your Christian walk and your spiritual journey, then uh, praise God for that. However, uh, we have enough in the four Gospels uh, on which there's pretty much universal agreement that these are reliable. We have enough in those four Gospels to get a very clear picture of what Jesus was talking about. And I don't think Jesus was just talking about um, something mystical okay i mean that's a part of it certainly the kingdom the kingdom of heaven is invisible and it's a it's a transformation that god wants to make in each of us as individuals uh, but most of what i see as uh, uh, mysticism uh seems to uh, not really lead to practical life-changing uh experiences and i i particularly see this with relation relation to the things jesus said about money and our relationship to money. That he was teaching a kingdom where people work for God and not for money seven days a week. 
Now that's that's a, a very special and unique teaching that opens up the kingdom of heaven to people in a way that no other uh, religious leader in the history of the world has ever done. Because he is the son of God, Jesus has the authority to say, my father will take care of your physical needs if you will spend your time building this mystical kingdom, the kingdom of faith and love. That's what he wants us doing in very practical terms, turning the world upside down by preaching this profound and revolutionary kingdom where people work for love rather than working for money. I don't know of any other uh, gospel or any other um, teacher in the world that has had the, the confidence to say such a thing. Another question from Christian. Please comment on women as pastors or preachers. I believe every single thing that Jesus said about women as pastors and preachers. I think that's nothing. I'm trying to remember. I just can't think of anything he said about women as pastors or preachers. Um, I keep trying to get this point across to people here that these are distractions. These are side issues. You know, let's start by being Christians. When we, when we get a, a group of people here who are really trying to follow Christ, then we might be able to work out, you know, which kind of um, uh, ketchup is best, you know, or uh, you know, whether artificial sweeteners are bad for us. We, we just get into these side issues so easily, uh, and it takes us away from obedience to the teachings of Jesus. Okay? I know some people must be saying he just won't let up, will he? And I'm telling you, I won't. That's not that's not why we're here. We're not here to talk about women pastors and preachers. Now, I have my own understandings about some of those things, but uh, you know, the, the person you're going to quote is Paul, and Paul said there's neither male nor female in Christ Jesus. Okay, another one. Uh, from Letiers, Letirza. I did not have any real type of relationship with the Bible or Jesus growing up, and I just started reading the Bible in January. I'm not comfortable praying as I do not know how. I'm sure there's no set formula for doing so, but I found you looking for a video that gave a guideline on how you should pray and an order in which you should pray. Thank God first, pray for people, etc. I like what you're doing. Can you give me your insight on praying? Thank you and enjoy your day. Um, and maybe if somebody can find me the, the reference uh, for the Lord's Prayer somewhere, I can, can give that out. I can't say it off the top of my head, um, but definitely uh, the disciples asked Jesus how to pray. So this is a, an understandable question in one way. I mean, in another way, just when you get the answer, you think, oh gosh, it's so simple. It's just talk to God. But because we can't see him, we feel a little bit funny you know, talking to someone that we can't see. It could be a problem. I see people walking down the streets all, all the time these days with their hand up to the ear talking to somebody that they can't see. <laughs> so, you know, just imagine God's on the other, other end of the phone line. And, uh, uh, but still, they ask Jesus, you know, how should we pray? And I think the question implies, you know, what are the things that we should pray for in particular? As for order? No, I, I don't think order is, is uh, what God's looking for. You know, any more than we, we think about what order do you say, uh, how are you, or, or good day. Um, it's the relationship that's most important. This relationship with God will come as, as we talk to him. So in the Lord's Prayer, uh, which is found in uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, and I've got glasses, that's verse 9, is it? Okay, it starts in Matthew chapter 6 at verse 9. Um, Jesus gives us, uh, the words from the Lord's Prayer. Is that the, com the complete one? He's uh, very good about uh, uh, teaching us to, uh, how do you say it, be Protestant and Catholic at the same time. There, there are two copies of uh, the Lord's <laughs> Prayer in the Gospels, and uh, one is used by Catholics and the other is used by Protestants, and the Protestant one is a bit longer, and that's the one from the Sermon on the Mount. So, uh, um, I won't read it all out here. Well, actually, I will. Okay. Um, and I'm reading from a, a modern translation. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. And there's so much that could be said about every every phrase in that uh, in that prayer. And maybe one day we'll we'll take the time to go through that. Uh, because it is important, our relationship with God and how we pray and what we pray for. And it's reassuring to know, well, this is how God wants us to pray. And I, I want to pray in his will, then there's the guideline for us. Okay, Schnorkel has come back with something. You're assuming that Jesus was talking to Gentiles. He wasn't. He was talking to observant Jews. They would never have assumed that Jesus was referring to anything other than food. Pork, shellfish, etc. isn't food, according to their definition. You're reading your own dietary laws into the text. The text has nothing to do with food in the first place. They didn't come to him asking why his disciples were eating unclean food. They asked him, why they didn't observe ritual washing. Jesus sums it up by saying one is not defiled by eating with unwashed hands. Again, this isn't to say that one shouldn't wash their hands before they eat, but that one isn't made clean or righteous by washing their hands. Do you see the distinction here? I think again in that respect, I think it's not going to go. The Old Testament says to wash after coming in contact with blood, corpses, etc. This doesn't make one righteous or justify us to God. Do we then stop washing ourselves when we come in contact with possible vectors of contamination? Do we throw the idea of preventing the spread of disease away just so we can show that we are not attempting to justify ourselves before God? I don't know. I, I, I'm sorry, but I just really have to say that this seems to me to be an argumentative spirit um, that is trying to uh, say a lot of things that the Bible's not really saying. You know, if, if Jesus says that which goes into your mouth, I don't care if you want to call it plastic. If he says that which goes into your mouth will not defile you, he means it. It's not going to defile. It might kill you, okay? But it's not going to defile you. And anybody who tries to uh, make it say something other than that is simply not listening to Jesus, and I don't think they're looking for the truth. I think they just want to argue, and that's what the Old Testament was really good at getting people to do. Uh, the Pharisees could argue about anything. They couldn't probably even get along with one another. So I'm not here to argue about a snarkle, okay? Jesus said, whatever goes in your mouth will not defile you. Uh, this one comes from Pam. It says, parentheses, eyes wide open. What do you think about the verse in the Bible, Psalm 82? I have said, you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. I watched someone talk about this and many more verses about how we are just host bodies and the fallen angels are in us. And that is why everything is upside down. But when we get saved, we choose good over evil, and we have chosen to be God's child again. And as long as we follow Jesus and have a relationship with him, believe on him and all that we do, that we will make it to the kingdom of heaven. I pray every day to be counted worthy, as well as to work hard to try and save the lost, or open their eyes at least. I'm sorry this is so long. God bless you in your ministry. Okay, thank you for those comments, Pam. And I'll move to the next one. Uh, this one comes from Derek. I'm open to counsel on this, but I think sometimes we have to be okay with saying we don't know. So many things are not revealed to us. And even that it is sometimes unknown. Though Jesus does pretty much say, say it will be revealed later. And so he also says in general, we couldn't handle it. Oh, good comment, Derek, and, and good reminder to me, because some of these people who come up with, uh, you know, uh, various 
uh, kind of extra revelations and things like that. I don't know quite how to answer them because, you know, each one of us is walking our own path. And, and uh, even though it may not be consistent with the way I've experienced God and how I understand God, the, the real question is, where is it all leading in the end? And, you know, if it's, it's leading to obedience to, uh, to Jesus and God, that's, that's a good thing. You know, I heard about somebody who was on drugs and he had a, a, an experience. It's a true story, not a joke. <laughs> As a true story, he had an experience while he was on drugs that, that um, really shook him up uh, about the, the reality of God and got his life together. So should you go around and preach that everyone should take drugs so they can become Christians? No. But that was the way God reached him. Okay, And so God can use so many different things for different people uh, as long as we don't try to make a doctrine about it afterwards. Uh, Callan again, when Jesus says to Pontius Pilate, my kingdom is not of this earth, by saying this to him, would it be wrong to think what Jesus meant is that he was talking about a spiritual church? What are your thoughts? Um, well, yes, the spiritual church is the kingdom of heaven. And so, yeah, I, I think what Jesus is saying is that his kingdom is not like the kingdoms of the world where you have soldiers and troops and weapons and you go and you fight one another. And so Pontius Pilate didn't need to feel um, threatened by Jesus, what Jesus was saying. And yet, in his own way, um, he was threatening Pilate, you see, because Pilate's kingdom was temporary and Jesus' kingdom was eternal. The one last question here. We're nearly getting through them. Okay, Frank says, Our Heavenly Father has a name. It is Yahuwah, Yahuwah in Hebrew. The Bible does say, know thy name. The word God in English can be plural and have other meanings. As Christians, we know this. People make almost everything a God today. In the English language, when we refer to the Heavenly Father, we capitalize the G. When we use his Yahuwah, this is an apostrophe, and I don't know how to pronounce the apostrophe, there is no mistake on who we are talking about, and it cannot be plural. I have several passages that says to know thy name. I can share with you later. Jesus' Hebrew name is Yahushua Messiah. I do believe God and Jesus look at our heart, but the Bible does say, know thy name. Well, uh, I'm sorry, Frank, but I'm not sure whether you actually know his name. You see, when uh, Moses asked God, when God was going to send him in to lead the children of Israel uh, out of Egypt and into the promised land. He said to God, well, who shall I say has sent me? And God said, tell him that sent you. But you didn't hear me say anything, did you? You know why? It's because you can't pronounce it. Nobody can pronounce the name of God because it has no vowels. And in our records today, we're not even sure of the consonants. It could be J or it could be Y. It could be W or it could be V. And so there are probably 20 or 30 different pronunciations that people have invented for that name. But now, when we talk about knowing God's name, and I guess this is probably why there are so many um, Hebrew Roots people here, because we have a video uh, called The Secret Name of Jesus. And that seems to be an obsession with these people is to find a magical name. And so that's going to just like unleash all the power and, and, the, and all the kingdom, the kingdom and the power and the glory will come to those who use the right name. But we don't really have an understanding and appreciation for what that meant in Bible times and in the, the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. That someone's name meant someone's authority. We want to know God's authority. And Jesus said, God has given me all authority. You can call him Yahushua. You can call him Yeshua. You can call him Jesus. You can call him Jesus, Meshiach, Messiah, Christ. Doesn't matter. He's the one who has all authority. And we have his teachings there in the Bible. Know his authority. And know where to go to find that authority. So all this other argument 
And as soon as you get into the, the question of well, how do you pronounce his name and how do you spell his name, the divisions begin immediately. Okay, maybe Frank, you've only just started. <laughs> okay, maybe you've only heard the one Hebrew pronunciation for the name. But get ready, brother, because you're going to get bombarded with others who tell you, no, you haven't quite got it right yet, Frank. And it will go on interminably. And what will be the fruit? What will be the fruit of that doctrine? No more Jesus. No more teachings of Yahushua or whatever you want to say. You'll just be arguing about his name from now until hell arrives. Okay, so we've reached the end of the questions and we've uh, been going for a fair while. Thank you, everybody, for staying there faithfully and, and listening. We still have over 100 uh, viewers, which I uh, thank you for. And I uh, look forward to another chat next uh, next week. The same time, same station. I think it'll be the same time. We're running into uh, uh, problems where uh, daylight savings is changing in various parts of the world and changes at different times. So hopefully not too many of you will miss out because of those uh, changes in your local time. God bless you and goodbye.